Dr. Alino, thank you very much for being here on the Stay Hold podcast today. It's fantastic speaking to you. Um, I think a great place to start is just give us a brief introduction to what you do and a little bit about your background, please. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I trained in the UK as a paediatric doctor. And around 10 years or so ago, we moved to Spain for lifestyle reasons. And a very long story short, I now help mothers lead their healthiest life and also how to teach their children healthy habits as well with my pediatric hat on thinking about how do we as parents help our kids become the healthiest adults that they can be in a way that they don't have to think about it and I'll just mention the words habits it's all about habits <laughs> I was going to ask I was like how do you do that what's the yeah what's the magic there because that sounds fantastic everyone wants to not think about something right how do we do that and habits is 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 that is that thing so yeah what does that look like how do you you know so you know and we've talked about this before and we, we you know and you've you've mentioned this before everyone knows what to do right? We all know, let's eat more vegetables, let's do more physical activity. But it's the actual doing it that is the difficult part. And I think that that's where I would see, you know, what you do comes into play. So what would that look like to someone who, you know, wants to make those changes, who wants to to feel better, to, to look better, to have better health? And how would you unpack that to, to that individual? Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. Um, it is all about doing and it's not a knowledge gap that um, most people have. And like you, I have four fabulous pillars. So the four pillars that I talk about are healthy eating, which in a nutshell is about fruit and vegetables and less packaged foods. Um, exercise that lights you up, delicious, healthy sleep and emotional wellness, including those stress levels. And then it becomes, OK, so I know what I want to do. How am I going to do that? And the answer is, essentially, you have to have habits. So habits are the bit without thinking. The definition of a habit is this is something that I do without thinking about it. So I want to have habits, systems and routines in all of those pillars so that I'm making sure that I maximize all the you know goodness I can out of those four pillars. And what I would say is it's a journey. I talk about a rickety bridge. So you're standing where you are now thinking, okay, I could really improve my life a little bit. I could make some healthier habits. And you want to get to place B, which is, okay, it's all working perfectly. I'm doing it all without thinking. I'm loving it. I've got habits, systems, routines in all four of those pillars. But how do I get from A to B? And the answer is what I call the rickety bridge. So you're going across this rickety bridge and we start thinking, okay, I'm going to start making habits but you're thinking about this habit, you know, perhaps your habit is, you know, I want to eat salad at lunchtime. And you're thinking about this. Now, if you're thinking about it, it means it's not a habit because you're thinking about it. And you're thinking, oh, I'm, I'm building this habit, I'm building this habit, and then life happens. And you suddenly you're pinged back like an elastic band to those old habits that you used to have. And then you feel deflated, demoralized, oh my goodness, I can't do it, nothing works for me. And the answer is, no, that's not true. <laughs> you just have a human mind and a human body. And the reality is, is that you had what I call a seedling habit, as opposed to a big fat oak tree habit. And when it's really an established habit, it's what you do on default. So when life happens, when you've got that really entrenched habit, that's what you do. And, you know, when we look at when COVID hit, we can see a lot of people went back to various habits or habits came out where they developed new habits. Now, not everybody developed less healthy habits. A lot of people developed more healthy habits because they were aware of what they were doing. Now, I don't mean to blame anyone. I think, you know, a lot of this is done subconsciously. We just don't realize what we're doing. But the answer is, when we are intentional about creating habits, that's when the magic happens because then we can create the habits that serve us and then we just sort of do them without thinking. Yeah, you used the word there, which I think is really key here, is intention. It's having intention with our actions that will lead to these healthier habits, you know, become, and you mentioned it, you want it to become part of your subconscious. But before it becomes part of our subconscious, we have to bring it into our conscious mind. And, and then that's where the intention comes in. So, you know, 
if somebody's, for example, you know, like like you said, everyone knows we need to eat more uh, vegetables. We need to do more exercise, and you know, we could talk about the other pillars as well. But um, how does that journey start for them? Because of course, in my experience, what I find is that people try to take on too much too soon. So what's your experience with that? And how would you help someone who maybe, you know, is wants to go on this journey? And maybe, you know, maybe in the past, they've, oh, I've tried diets, doctor, and this hasn't worked for me. And I've never been able to do this. And it's been too complicated. And, and where do you where do you start with someone like that? Yeah, no, that's, it's a really good question. And I think there's two different points that I would say. And the first thing is, it is so much easier to make changes if you've got help, if you've got accountability, if you're working in a group. So I would really recommend working with a coach, you know, someone like yourself, someone like myself. I have a group program. And so I support people through that. And the reality is, if you do that, you get there much quicker, much quicker, much quicker. Now, on a side note, if you aren't in a position where you're making changes with someone help, with some support then you want to be doing it in a slower and more steady way. So, you know, making one small habit and really making that part of your fabric and then making another one. But it is a much slower way. So if you are working with a coach, I mean, to answer what what I actually do is I normally start with people in the pillar one, in the nutrition, and I work people through a two-week reboot. And that is looking at your habits. And the idea is, you know, you just eat really healthily for two weeks. Now, you don't want to, in the long run, be in a place where you're looking at, oh my goodness, I have to deprive myself. It's all about discipline. Habits are not about discipline. Habits are about making it easy for you to do the habits you want and making it difficult for you to do the habits that you don't want. However, you can disrupt your habits and disrupting your habits is a really good thing to do if you then create habits in an intentional way. So we can see that disruption works when we look at COVID. It disrupted a lot of people's habits and they made new habits. So the the idea behind the two-week reboot is it's a really good way to show your body, your mind, that you can do things in a different way and that actually it's not so scary, it's even enjoyable and it's easy, and it's fun. And then after the end of the two weeks, you can carry on doing it for a bit longer if you want, or you can take what worked and get rid of what didn't work. So that's how I do it. I think as well, right at the beginning, thinking about mindset as well, and thinking about your emotional aspect and what's driving your habits. And there's several keys which are important in this. Number one is At the moment, a lot of emotions are driving our habits that we have at the moment. So for example, you might, I'll give you a story of one of my clients that I had in the past. And she was busy. She would come back from work feeling tired and exhausted and stop off at the garage and buy chocolate. What's going on there underneath is an emotional need to look after herself. You know, I need a reward. I've got to go home now and look after my kids. I just need a bit of a break. And that emotion is driving eating the chocolate. And I've recorded, like, I'm not breaking confidentiality. We recorded a podcast about this. <laughs> She's a, she was a dentist. And so she knows that eating chocolate is not a great way to lose weight or be healthy. Yet she feels that she can't break this habit. And when you look underneath, what's really going on is that she needs to give herself more time to look after herself. So that might be running or reading or just finding time in her day where she's really fulfilling that emotional need. And then doing other things like perhaps changing the route back from the way you drive so that you're not passing that same garage the whole time. And combining the two means, ah, yeah, it becomes much, much easier to break that habit or replace it with something else. The other aspect of that emotional thread is that if you want to make changes and you're not looking at that emotional thread, it becomes really difficult because life happens. Life always happens. You always get those same stressors and those same things that knock you sideways. And if you don't understand that, you don't look at that, you don't become aware of that, you end up going back to your old behaviors. And so you may have changed your eating for a little bit, but then you just end up reverting back to your old habits. 
So I teach people those two in tandem, and then we sort of add in the movement and the sleep, depending on on where they are. But essentially, you need to do it in a stepwise way. As you say, you know, if you try and do everything all at once, you just end up going, well, I can't do anything, and going back to where you are and just feeling worse because you then feel despondent and like nothing works for you, whereas it's not true. It's just not true. In that case, what's happened is you've made it easy to give up, right? You've made it easy not to continue with that, with those changing habits. And I think that's something you just said, which I think is so powerful in that your habits need to be easy. These things are very easy for you. Ask anyone, you know, um, if anything they do on a regular basis, I don't know, brushing your teeth, right? Now, I'll say this carefully, but most people don't have to motivate themselves first thing in the morning to brush their teeth. It's something that just happens automatically. It's it's coming from... You haven't met my eight-year-old son. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, mo- that's why I say most people. And I look, I'm going through this with my daughter. It's been... and But this is something I say all the time, right? I say, well, look, let's look at brushing your teeth. And I'm going through this model. She's, she's four. For the last three years of my life, I have been chasing her around the house morning and night. Brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. Right. And, and, and this is happening. I'm sure this happens to all of us. But I'm OK with it because I know at some point it's going to click. Right. And there's education. She's going to she goes to the dentist now and she's getting education from the dentist. She's getting education from me. At some point, she's going to just wake up in the morning and brush her teeth. And if you look and analyze why that has happened, well, there's several factors. Of course, there's a, there's the nagging parent. There's someone telling you to do it. That's fine. But there's also time. And I think this is something that, you know, I think we live in this culture. I call it the Insta culture, right? We want everything now, right? I want a pizza. I can look at my phone. And I don't even have to pick it up and I can talk to it and get a pizza at my door right now. You know, I want to go and watch a movie. I can go and watch any movie I want. I can pause it. I can rewind it. I want everything now. And it, the health is, you know, our brain is got, got thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. We're not, we're not uh, the latest Apple MacBook, you know, pro in our head. It's not, it doesn't work that way. However, time does help us in time and giving yourself that time, just like brushing someone's, you know, learning to brush your teeth over time and over repetition. And then maybe there's a little bit of an emotional connection there as well. You know, maybe the first time the kid gets a tooth problem is, oh, well, why did that happen? Well, maybe it was because the, the, the tooth brushing, you weren't consistent with it or you didn't do it properly. Oh, right. Okay. So I need to do this because otherwise I'm going to have to go to the dentist a lot more, you know, and then there's an emotional connection there as well. But it's the time, it's the repetition, it's the emotion that's going to really instill that habit over the long term and make it subconscious, which I think is really, really powerful. Yeah, basically. You know, people say, how do I form a habit? And, you know, there's loads of books that you can read about habit formation. But the crux of it is repeat, 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 repeat. And that's it. Yeah, you want to make it easier for yourself to repeat it. But the bottom line is, yeah, you repeat it. And so when we look at children and brushing teeth, yeah, they're going to grow up brushing their teeth because, you know, we're there to support them. Really, it's us who's, we have to look at why are we supporting our children? Why do I go through all of that effort to make my children brush their teeth when, oh my goodness, life would be so much easier if I didn't have to do that. But obviously we do because we know the importance of brushing their teeth, even if they don't. But for them, they're going to repeat it so, so, so many times that by the time they leave home, it will just be a habit. It will just be something that they do without thinking. Yeah. But one of the things I think about is when we're standing at that moment and thinking, okay, I want to be intentional in making habits. We have different parts of our brain. And I think it's really interesting to understand this. We have our thinking part of our brain, our prefrontal cortex, which is the bit that goes, hey, let's give up chocolate because not eating chocolate is really going to help us lose weight and all the other things, reduce our risk of diabetes. And then we have our habit brain, which is obviously not a scientific term, but it is that, you know, big old part of our brain. Why do we have habits? Because they are efficient. If our brain had to think about everything it did all the time, you know, we would be, well, firstly, we'd forget to brush our teeth. But can you imagine every morning if you woke up thinking, oh, I'm going to do this teeth brushing thing. How do I do this? You know, as we learn stuff, as we do this new stuff, it takes a lot of energy. So we have this system where it's efficient to do things like brushing your teeth. And it's just this program, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. So when you're thinking, okay, I've got this habit, which is clearly rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, but it's not helping me. How do I change that? You have to remember that that habit part is really, really strong. So when you come to chocolate eating time and your thinking brain is going, hey, we've given up eating chocolate and your 
habit brain is going, oh no, it's three o'clock. It's chocolate time. We just eat chocolate. That's going to be the strongest voice. And your thinking brain has to really think ahead and think, okay, but I want to put myself in a situation where it's impossible for me to eat chocolate. I like the analogy of, you know, those toy trains that our children have. You know, they lay out the tracks and then you wind up a little toy train and you watch it go. So your thinking brain is putting down the track and your your habit brain is that train. And so you have to think in advance, okay, at three o'clock, I need to make it really difficult for me to eat the chocolate. So I'm going to make sure there's an apple by my side. I'm going to put on a good radio show as I'm driving back from work. I'm going to make sure I go in a different way so I don't go past that garage where I always find that I end up buying chocolate. And we really have to be a bit clever with ourselves and know ourselves and be honest with ourselves because we know ourselves more than anybody, but you know what you're going to do. And so having that self-awareness really just helps you build that habit so that you can repeat, repeat, repeat until you get to the stage where you're like, oh, I don't even think about chocolate at three o'clock anymore now. Mm. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, the idea of making it easy and, you know, creating that environment or making it difficult in this case, an example that you go, how can I make it difficult to, to carry out this action? We can go back to brushing your teeth. You know, we say that it's repeat, 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 but it was also there's other factors there as well. We, you know, we make it easy for us to brush our teeth. You know, if I ask anyone the question, where do you keep your toothbrush? I'm, I'm hoping that, well, I'm guessing most people are going to say in their bathroom rather than it's in, out in my front, un, under my front doormat here. Well, <laughs> why is it in your, why is it in your bathroom? Well, because first thing in the morning, what you do is you go into the bathroom typically and, oh, there's my toothbrush. I'll brush my teeth. If you had to go outside to go and grab your toothbrush every morning, you're unlikely to, that, that habit, it's just too much. There's too many steps there. There's too many things to do. And it's, you know, it makes it harder to do that thing. So just turning that around in something that you are trying to stop doing in the case of, you know, eating chocolate, how can I make it more difficult? Or how can I make it easier not to eat chocolate if you want to try and frame it in a different way, but, or how can I make it easier to do more physical activity? So it's looking at, looking at those little things there and, you know, how we can make these things easier easier for us to do and a lot of that does come down to our environment design you know and you know i talk about this on our program a lot it's you know if it's not there you can't eat it you know so um you know there's there's, there's that way of looking at it and i think making your exercise habits i mean you know there's lots of different ways we can do that can we touch on that a little bit what are some of these you know these things that people can do to make it easier for themselves to, to make some changes yeah, definitely. Um, so I think the most important thing you can do with exercise is finding something that you enjoy. Because if you don't enjoy it, if you don't get that instant, not necessarily instant, but afterwards, if you don't get that, oh, I feel good, you know. Like for me, I love swimming. And when I'm feeling a bit tired and grumpy, my husband's like, you need to go for a swim. <laughs> a lot of people say, oh, I'm too tired to exercise. And I think you've got it the wrong way around. Exercise is what gives you energy. And a lot of people might think you're kidding, right? No, I'm absolutely not. Energy, um, exercise is where our energy comes from. Now, I will admit that when you're getting into the habit of exercising, there is a little rickety bridge that you need to cross. So, you know, if you're building up running, that might look like, oh my goodness, I feel like the tin man the next day. I can't move my legs at all. But the good news is, that means you've done some work and your muscles are getting stronger. So number one, find something that you enjoy. And it doesn't have to be running or swimming or cycling. Cycling's great and fabulous. But it could be something like dancing or kayaking. You know, you don't have to think of conventional exercise. It just is about movement. It can be hiking, going for a walk around the block, going for a quicker walk around the block. So number one, find something that you enjoy and find ways of making it more enjoyable. So I love swimming, but it's much more fun swimming with my friends than it is swimming by myself. Well, I do like swimming by myself, but I know for me, knowing myself that if I've made a commitment to somebody else to meet them, to go swimming, I'm going to turn up. Whereas if there's nobody else there, do I go? Do I not go? I'm not letting anybody else down. And that's important to me. Equally, if I've paid for a club, 
if I've paid to do yoga or something else, I know I'm not going to miss that session because, you know, I've paid for it. So I want to make sure I've got my money's worth. So knowing yourself as well, I think is, is really useful. And I think in terms of busyness, you know, we can do short amounts. It doesn't have to be, oh my goodness, it's going to take me two hours a day. You know, you can do things like squats whilst you're brushing your teeth. You know, that's habit stacking. Everybody has that habit of brushing your teeth. But if you do two minutes of squats or leg lifts or whatever small exercise you want to do twice a day, that's 28 minutes a week. That's a lot of exercise just spread out. And you can do the same with five minutes. So I love, I do a seven minute workout. It's so easy. It strangely takes eight minutes, but you know, it's so easy to fit in and I do it in the morning when my kids are there. So, you know, for people who have kids, I know it's difficult to fit exercise around your children, but it is something that you can do with them there. Or, you know, there's so many resources on the internet for a 10 minutes Pilates session or a yoga session, or, you know, it's just finding those little bits of time. But what you want to do is put it in your routine. So do it at a consistent time, every single day, or, you know, it, you don't necessarily have to do it every single day. It might be Saturday morning, but once you've got that habit, it's much, much easier to keep. And another thing I think is really useful for exercise is sports watches. I really love sports watches for two reasons. Number one, I think they really help us become aware of when we're having a sedentary day. And I really noticed this when it was locked down in Spain, we weren't allowed out of our houses for six weeks unless it was to go shopping. And my exercise levels plummeted, even though I was conscious of that and trying to keep them up. But it's actually really difficult to, you know, I walked around the garden 30 times. We only have a small garden. And, and you know, how many times can I walk around the garden in a day? But my exercise watch really just highlighted that to me. Oh, my goodness, you've only done 2000 steps today. The other aspect of the exercise watches is that they really just help us get into that gamification. You know, you have a streak or a challenge and they might challenge you a bit. You know, you do a 5K run or this weekend, if you do a 7K run, you get an extra point or a 10K run. And just like joining in those little games really just helps you go that little bit further. And finding groups is another great way. Find a group of people who are going to encourage you. Yeah. That that watching example, what you just what you just described there, the gamification of it, it's made it more fun. Yeah, and it goes back to your first point, which I think is, uh, and I, I stress this with everyone I talk to about physical activity, especially as a personal trainer. You know, we we, you, and and I always use and use the word physical activity as opposed to exercise because when I say exercise, people typically think of running, swimming, jogging, lifting weights, doing Pilates, doing yoga, and yeah, that's fine, but. I think habit stacking is is a fantastic way to get some of that time back that we're, you know, we probably are throwing down the drain. And I love the toothbrushing example. Uh, another one I can think of, especially here in the UK, because everyone likes to drink tea, you know, is boiling your kettle. You know, <laughs> and I, I ask this to a lot of my patients, how long does it take for you to boil your kettle? And it's a couple of minutes. What do you do when your kettle's boiling? And if you're like me, I used to grab this thing and just stand there and, you know, oh, let me have a look at what's on, what's my Instagram. But if you take that two minutes and again, ask the question, how many times do you boil your kettle in a day? You know, it's, I've had answers from zero to 20. So, you know, if we take, let's say it's four or five, well, five minutes every, so five times you boil your kettle and it's two minutes every time, five times two, that's 10 minutes. So just by doing something, and it could just be marching up and down on the spot in your kitchen, but doing that instead of sitting down, that's 10 minutes a day you've accumulated. You, how many days, how many days of the week do people drink co tea or coffee every day? Well, that's 70 minutes in your week. And you just yeah, got an hour. Of it. it adds up. And I think this and it comes back to that insta culture. It's like, oh, what's what's two minutes going to do, Sanjay? What's five minutes going to do? It's 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 not going to do anything. Well, actually, it has a profound impact if you can repeat those behaviours. So, I love that idea, and especially the idea of fun. And again, we co we go back to children. You know, look, look at my take my daughter for example. She's four. I'll leave. I'll be going out the door and saying, I'm just going walking down to the corner shop down the road. You want you want to you fancy come with me? And she's drawing or doing some sort of artwork, and it's like she. she she hears me, but she doesn't even acknowledge me, right? It's like, no, dad, no, that's not, doesn't interest me, right? But I say, I'm going out to the shops to get some whatever it is. Um, and I hold up her scooter and I say, hey, do you want to jump on your scooter and come with me? She's standing by the door with her shoes on, helmet on, wagging her tail like a dog, ready to go. <laughs> Why? Why did she not want to come out with me? Suddenly I introduced her. It's fun. It's enjoyment. Yeah. yeah she's yeah. like, oh, well, that's fun. I want to ride my scooter. Look, we're no different. 
we're kids, no different. Kids are a great example. I love learning from kids. Yes. So my kids, you know, if I take them for a walk, exactly like your daughter, it's like, oh my goodness. And it takes us forever. And we're going at a snail's pace. <laughs> But then sometimes they'll get like a long leaf. We have these long sort of palm leaves here and they've got swords and suddenly they're knights and I can't keep up with them. And they're running because they want to go and see the donkey. And I'm like, wait for me, wait for me. The difference is just in their brain. There's no difference. It's exactly the same, but they've somehow just changed it to, I want to do this as opposed to, I don't want to do it. And when children don't want to do something, oh my goodness, you cannot make them do it. Yeah, I think adults are the same as well in the same way, right? If someone doesn't want to do something like exercise, like I don't want to go to the gym. It's like, okay, well, you don't have to go to the gym. And I think fun, you know, it's a separate conversation, but I think, you know, fun seems to get sort of, as we go through life, you know, fun gets removed and removed and removed. And we think, then we get to a point where we say, well, I'll have fun when I retire. Have fun today. Yeah, you, the, you can. Ev- and the, you know, we can have fun. And if you're not having fun, then I think you need to find a way to to create that fun. Because, you know, and I love that you used the example of dancing earlier as a physical activity, as exercise. And I would definitely call that exercise. You know, well, I think dancing's fantastic because I've never seen anyone dance who's miserable. Yes, and it's a great <laughs> thing to do if you have kids as well. Put on some music. I have to confess, we love the Disney soundtrack because my oh, kids gosh. love. I know. <laughs> It's the same, it's, it's right, like a mirror, mirror image of our household here by the sounds of it but put it on particularly at washing up time teaching your kids to wash up put it on make it fun move a little bit and it's you know it doesn't have to be long just a few minutes because we want to get on with the jobs but it changes the mood it's really interesting that i think that's to do with emotions and emotions also being habits so we talk about habits in the way we behave but also we have have habits in the way we think and our emotions. And music is a really interesting concept because the minute we put music on, we can change our emotions. We can become sad or we can become happy. And that is another habit that we have. We associate Disney cheerful soundtracks with the emotion of happy and we put it on and we feel happy and we want to move. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, exactly. I I completely agree. Music is is a big big factor for me not just for motivating me and wanting me to have fun but to um you know to to help me to de-stress you know i listen to music i put my headphones on and i'll just go about doing the vacuum cleaning or whatever it is and it just helps me to feel better and i think that's such an important factor um talking on just want to touch on i mentioned that you know just to de-stress i think sometimes people struggle to engage in healthier habits or engage in new ways of, of, of doing things because you know there could be chronic levels of stress in our lives there could be other you know more serious issues anxiety depression things like that without going into too much in, in depth because it's a very separate conversation but if someone's feeling those types of emotions what are there any what sort of steps would you would you help how would you help that person to sort of you know see differently and think differently to try and engage in healthy habits yeah it's a really really good question actually um and it does depend where people are so when i help people in my group program As I say, we start on what I call pillar four, emotional wellness. And for some people, that is the strongest, strongest, you know, it's the one where they have to do the most work before they even do anything like take on healthy eating or exercise. They really need to improve their relationship with themselves and the habits that they have in the way they think about themselves and the emotions that they have surrounding themselves. And so there are a lot of amazing exercises you can do of basically building up that positive aspect and thinking of yourself in a positive way. A lot of people, most people, are really mean to themselves. You know, we have this voice which is, oh, I'm not worthy, I don't do enough. And when we contrast that with how they would talk to their friends, they would be much kinder, much more considerate to their friends than they are to themselves. And so building up that habit of saying, I am enough and I am worthy and I am worth prioritizing. Sometimes people have to do that first. But that thread just needs to continue, continue, continue. We always need to be working on that self-awareness. How do we treat ourselves? What's my what are my emotions right now? Do a little check-in, you know, am I feeling in a good place? Or, oh, am I beginning to feel a little bit triggered? And the sooner we can recognize that the sooner we can do something about it. What we don't want to do is leave it till, you know, the the walls are tumbling down around us and it's an emergency. 
we don't want to be living on that, what I call tiger emotion, you know, I'm being chased by a tiger. Mm. And um, as a parent, I find my kids are always <laughs> in that emotional, oh my goodness, it's a, you know, there's a tiger chasing me. And I'm like, no, you're just tying your shoelace. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really an emergency. Can we just calm down a little bit? And, you know, particularly for kids, it takes time to grow that. But, you know, for adults as well, we just need to keep working on it and we need to keep working on it. And when you recorded the podcast on my podcast, one thing that you mentioned was meditation. And meditation is a really, really, really useful tool in helping us to stop feeling that emotion, that trigger, that oh my goodness, flight, flight, you know, running away emotion and calming down. And again, meditation is a habit. It's a muscle that we need to learn and we need to build it into our routine, start small, enjoy it, you know, think, oh, wow, this is a little break for my brain from all of that stuff that is going on in the day. And I'm going to just enjoy this few minutes, start with two, perhaps build up to three, Try an hour, you know, if you, you can have a recorded one if you want to. But the point is, you know, just keep doing it and keep enjoying it. So I think emotions, self-talk and meditation. Meditation is a big yeah. one. So self-compassion, isn't it? It's just, yeah. just being nice to yourself and looking after yourself. And I think, you know, real self-care is is interesting because you know if someone says well you know i'm but i am looking after myself i treat myself to an ice cream or a, or a chocolate and, and, I, and i do that all the time and that's me being nice to myself and you know i would say well that's okay so in the moment you're feeling good and that's great but is it you know think about it from a long, longer term a bigger perspective you know if you carried on acting out that behavior over and over again every time you felt stressed or whatever was happening in your life and you went for chocolate you went for ice cream what would happen to your health is that, and then you know, you'd switch the question, is that real self-care? Is that really looking after yourself? Whereas if you can, you know, I love the idea of meditation. And again, it come, I, I use the example, it comes back, it always comes back to brushing your teeth for some reason. Um, but, you know, I, so when I talk about meditation, you know, again, it comes back to that Insta culture. It's like, well, I, it didn't do anything, you know. Okay, well, fine. But it's, like you said, it's a habit. It's something you can build. And meditation, I I think meditation needs to be classed in the same way as brushing your teeth. Why do we brush our teeth? Well, we don't always brush our teeth because you wake up in the morning and you've got tooth decay, right? Yeah, your mouth might might be a bit smelly, so you react to that and you brush your teeth. But you brush your teeth to prevent yourself from getting tooth problems in the future. And I think meditation for me is exactly like that. Yes, you can use it as a reactive. You know, I use it as a reactive. I've had a stressful email or I have a phone or a session where someone was not, not very nice to me and I think, oh, I need to do it. And I'll, I'll spend a few minutes just being at peace and counting my breaths. However, by doing it on a regular basis, I'm hoping to prevent myself from getting into those states and getting into those places in the future. And I think thinking of it, think of it, thinking of it like that helps people to sort of say, okay, well, meditation can actually help me in these moments. And I think that's real, you know, that's when we look at the real value of self-care as well. Yeah, I think so too. And I think, you know, coming back to your example of ice cream, one of the things I say to people, and, you know, I think you're absolutely right. We don't want to be treating ice cream as that emotional, this is where I look after myself. We all want to eat ice cream and cookies and whatever it is, alcohol. When you do that, do it 100%. And I don't mean 100% by, oh, eat the whole cake. I mean, really enjoy what you're doing. Don't do it in a sort of like, oh, I'm feeling a bit guilty and I'm going to do it frequently. When you do it, really relish it and really think, oh, wow, I'm really enjoying this cake. And when you start to do that, you realize that cake is delicious, but sometimes it's a little bit disappointing in that you have this huge great expectation of, oh, I'm going to have this lovely cake. And then you eat it and you're like, eh, that was okay. But actually, I realized that I can get satisfaction in other ways, like meditation or swimming or having a hug with my family or laughing with my family. And once you really begin to see those things, you begin to unravel that connection between emotions and food. And that's really where we want to get to is, you know, why do we eat? We eat to nourish ourselves and we take care of our emotions in other ways that we aren't taking care of our emotions through food. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so powerful. And I think just trying to link it back to emotions, I think is a, is a really good way of looking at it. Um, before we, uh, before we finish up today, we talked a lot about habits. What I would love to know, and I'm sure the listeners would as well is what are the healthy habits 
that you have in your life that are non-negotiable, right? So what is what is non-negotiable for you each <laughs> <All of them>. <laughs> day? <laughs> All of them. So yeah, totally. Like for me, healthy eating is what I do because I like to eat that way. And I do eat treats and cakes and things like that. Like when my mum is there, um, partly because I have kids and to keep that balance, I think, you know, you don't want to be like, oh, we don't ever, ever, ever eat these things because that just makes kids want them more. So it's getting that balance right. And, you know, I do enjoy those things from time to time. Um, Exercise is definitely a non-negotiable. If I don't exercise, I go stir crazy. And I also know that my productivity levels go down and I don't have the emotional energy that I want to give to my clients, to my family, to myself. Sleep is definitely a non-negotiable. Um, and, you know, it's such a habit. My bedtime is such a habit that my brain just stops working. And unless there's some emergency, essentially my brain just goes, it's time to go to sleep now. And then the emotional wellness bit is something that, you know, I'm constantly working on in terms of, I think, that self-awareness piece is, you know, look at things with curiosity rather than, you know, why, what happened there? Why did I get cross about that? Oh, I see. I saw that in this particular way. So it's something that I think is just a journey to enjoy and to think, okay, what's the next step? What's the next step? So yeah, essentially all four of them are non-negotiable. All four of them are non-negotiable. <laughs> I love that. That's brilliant. Practicing what you preach and, and role modeling the way. Brilliant. Um, where can people find out more about your work, your coaching programs, the work that you're doing? Where can they find you? Oh, fabulous. Thank you so much for asking me. So I have a podcast called Fit and Fabulous at 40 and Beyond. And we have fabulous guests. And my website is drorlina.com. And there you can, if you're interested in working with me, I have either a group program called Healthy You, Healthy Family, which is a fabulous program. Um, or I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and you can book a call, what I call a breakthrough session to just chat and see, you know, where you are, where you'd like to get to, if we're a good fit to work together. Fantastic. I'll, uh, I'll pop all the links in the episode and show notes so everyone can uh, access those. I highly go and, I recommend go and have a look and check out uh, the website and yeah, get in touch and uh, have a chat. You never know where that can take you. Um, Dr. Lena, thank you very much for your time and your uh, your energy and your enthusiasm and your wisdom today. It's been, it's been a pleasure speaking to you and I look forward to speaking to you again. Thank you so much for having me.